panel is going to be moderated uh, by Chris Lukey. Uh, Chris spent over a decade at Rockwell Automation as a sales leader, helping his customers build everything from consumer electronics all the way up to uh, commercial aircraft. So really spanning the scale of sophistication, uh, volume, complexity. Um, more excitingly, Chris runs uh, one of my favorite podcasts it's called The Manufacturing Happy Hour. It's available anywhere you can find podcasts. Um, this is what I spend a lot of my commute with. Uh, if you like candid interviews, you know, kind of forgetting the, the corporate PR for a sec, just real candid interviews with manufacturing and engineering leaders, which I assume you do because you're all here, um, I highly recommend uh, you give the manufacturing happy hour uh, a look. I will put the link in the comments for everyone. Um, and Chris is, Chris is going to introduce a, a super exciting guest, uh, Milo Werner, and I will hand it to him. Thank you for the intro. Good to be here this afternoon and welcome everyone to Build Better. Our guest today has some of the most exciting and most practical hands-on experience when it comes to working on first-generation products. Milo Werner joined Tesla in 2007 at a critical stage in the company's trajectory where she led new product introduction, launching the Model S powertrain, dual motor, driver's assist, and most importantly, Model X. In addition to Tesla, Milo ran new product introduction at Fitbit, launching, our four, uh, launching four factories in China and transitioning the company to fully automated production. She's also led engineering and product for Zola, a startup providing distributed energy to over a million families in sub-Saharan Africa. And now she's a general partner at The Engine, where her dedication to solving some of the world's biggest problems from climate to health to computing and beyond continues. I'm excited to welcome Milo Warner to today's conversation. Milo, welcome to Build Better, and thanks for getting our program kicked off today. Thank you. It's great to be here. We're excited to have you, and, and in true manufacturing fashion, right, we, we've been talking about how these are candid interviews, right? So I'd like to start off as having, we're having a, a candid conversation, and really the best way to start that is with a story, right? So we're excited to learn about new product introduction from you today, but I feel like we really can learn a lot from your own story. So let's start off with how did you get into Tesla and what was your first introduction into new product development? Yep, yep. It's a great, oh my gosh, it's a great story. So um, I was working at a unnamed manufacturing facility, which is known for copy exactly. And I just felt like I didn't want to copy exactly. I wanted to be creative and explore and do new things. And um, so when I was done with that internship, um, I had a friend who had bought VIN number one of the Tesla Roadster, and um, he gave me Elon's email address. And I wrote Elon way back in like 2006 and said, I want to join your company. It's so cool. And um, he never responded. Uh, <laughs> then I emailed a bunch of other people. And finally, um, I was awarded with an unpaid internship job. I showed up on January 2nd, 2007, uh, ready to go. And um, I did all sorts of things, uh, you know, really whatever they needed. I was uh, just wrapping up my master's degree at MIT and um, I wrote manufacturing instructions. I, yeah, yeah, it was really, it's really amazing experience. You want me to get to part two on how I got into new product introduction? Yeah, I, I, well, I love the tenacity there, emailing Elon, getting, you know, getting that unpaid internship, doing whatever it takes to get started. Um, excellent story on how you got introduced there. But yeah, let's talk new product, uh, new product development. How did you come into that at that point? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was on maternity leave and um, all my peers were fired. Um, and I came back from maternity leave and I did not know my boss. Uh, a wonderful man named Greg Reichow. And um, so, you know, I introduced myself. I had, you know, all the things you come with when you come back from maternity leave. And he was like, oh, wonderful. You know, you can take over the manufacturing process for all Model S powertrain stuff. And I was like, okay, I've uh, never been a manager before, never led a team, but great. I'm happy to have a job. Um, and so um, I kind of from the grounds up, Ground up, built out uh, the new product introduction team, hiring uh, project managers and uh, supervisors. I inherited a team of about 100 uh, really awesome technicians um, uh, and engineers. And it was just amazing opportunity 
uh, to build the Model S powertrain and support the launch of the Model S uh, powertrain team. It was just incredible. So you're coming back from maternity leave, new boss, new role. I feel like maybe the next question is a little obvious, but what, what are some of the challenges you came across while working on the Model S powertrain, particularly any that really surprised you? Yeah. Um, there, there was like two main challenges. One was, uh, you know, management of a big team um, that was in a real place of uncertainty, right? All the leadership had had basically been let go and they were kind of wondering, well, what's going to be next? What, what, what's happening now? Um, so figuring out that kind of on the ground, there could be nothing better than having a innocent new mother in charge that, you know, pretty much can only speak the truth um, and to put a lot of kind of confidence and, and support in how things were going to happen. Um, but then the other challenge was, you know, we were really learning real time on the floor um, how the product was performing, right? So we would run into manufacturing challenges that were really indicative of early field failure, right? So building uh, inverters, you know, we we're blowing IGBTs while we were testing them, while we were, you know, kind of going into low volume production, figuring out, you know, how are we going to manage, you know, kind of parallel path engineering and launch into production. And and we actually have some audience questions as well as we're going to throw this. So throw this. So by the way, as we're going through this conversation, if you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat in the comments. We're going to have some time for Q and A at the end. But let's start with an audience poll here, right? So this is the first one for the folks in the audience that have worked in first generation projects. What was the hardest part for you? And there are a few options here. It's transition of processes from lab to production, process and capability and con uh, control. Uh, option B, tolerances. Option C, late engineering changes or something different. So we're going to keep our conversation going as people answer. We'll, we'll revisit these in a second. But Milo, my next question for you is, what was the most important lesson you learned from building a first generation product from your work on the Model S powertrain? Yeah, you know, um, I think probably the most important piece is the understanding that all teams have to work together integrated. You know, the old school method of launching prod products is the engineering team does their work and then they toss it over the wall to the operations team and then the operations team does their work. And usually when that happens, the operations team discovers all sorts of things like hey, I actually can't automate this part the way you designed it, or I don't know, there's many different things. And so realizing that starting everybody together at the beginning of the product development cycle, including the manufacturing engineers, the quality team, um, starting to, to teach people how to ma manufacture it. I think manufacturing instructions, the most important thing you can do is to start everybody at the same time. Um, no, I, I love that, right? Because, you know, you think about it as you're bringing out a new product. And, and I feel like I encountered this in like senior design projects early on as an engineer, right? If you're not thinking about what comes after design operations, all those next steps, you can come into some of those roadblocks. In fact, I'm interested to see what, what some other people have learned and, and from those challenges because we just got our results back. Um, it looks like uh, transition of processes from lab to production uh, about half the group said, hey, that's where we had our biggest challenges. And and another one was around late engineering changes. It's about an even split between transition of processes and late engineering changes. I mean, Milo, does that, does that check out with you? Does that kind of make sense that you'd expect the audience to have that kind of response to that? I mean, fundamentally, they're probably connected, right? There's nothing better than picking some super sensitive adhesive in the lab that you can control perfectly and then trying to put it on a, a manufacturing floor that doesn't have any climate control and maybe the FIFO isn't quite working in the in the warehouse, you know, that leads directly to picking like a more uh, resilient adhesive, you know. So like I think they're they're very intertwined. Great, great examples of that. You know, we actually have another audience question that uh, we're about to add out there. And we're going to continue with your story right after that, Milo, because this ties in. So um, when you are working on a next generation uh, product, how much are you reusing, right? So this is the audience question, a lot, a little, or nothing. Um, but Milo, this is going to transition into the next part 
of your story because we've been talking Model S powertrain so far, but you've done a lot more than than that. This was just your soiree into new product introduction. So, you know, tell us about Model X or one of the other endeavors based on the lessons and experiences you got from Model S. What was easier and what were some new challenges that came up by the time you got to the Model X launch? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the expectation is, is that the, the first generation product that you make takes a little bit longer to get to market and everybody understands that. But as you start grooving your new product introduction strategy, the timeline starts to shorten, right? And people start to compress those pieces in. And, um, and some of the work that we did at Tesla uh, to help that compression was to launch different components into the current products that we knew we were going to need in future products, right? So um, an example would be is we we transition the Model S chassis over to be a conversion between the Model X and the Model S. So we, we transition the chassis over before we launch Model X. We also launched dual motor, right? And the purpose of that was that if you're going to launch a uh, SUV, you have to have all wheel drive, right? And so that is a huge reason why the Model S transitioned to all wheel drive was that we needed that technology ready to go, totally proved out when we went to the launch of the Model X. So when we came to launching the Model X, it was, there were many, many new components, but we were not discovering new technology. We were not implementing new technology. We were launching new body parts, new closure strategies. Um, new interiors, but the powertrain and the chassis were pretty much already set and in production. So does that, I mean, if you've done a lot of that, would you say it got easier by the time you got to the Model X? Is that fair to say? Or were there other challenges that came up? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you're ramping faster on that mm -hmm. next gen product, right? Like, I mean, probably for six months, we made... I don't know, uh, you know, 25 cars a week, then 50 cars a week, then for Model S, 100 cars a week. And when we got to Model X, the, you know, the line's already running at full speed, right, with Model S's. And now you're trying to sprinkle Model X in on top. It's got to run at the same speed. So, so I would say, you know, a lot of the challenges we ran into were bringing the production line up faster. Mm. Okay. All right. So some of, so new challenges is at the end of the day is, is what we got. And, and actually our audience results just came in from, from their perspectives on, on using or reusing uh, things from past projects. And what they had to say was it's another 50, 50 split, right? I'll, I'll cut to the chase. No one said they're not reusing anything, right? So at least people are taking some of the best practices that, that they've done before, but it's a 50, 50 split again, about 45% said, Hey, we're using a lot. And then 54% are saying, yeah, we used, we used a little of it. Right. So um, any, any thoughts on that, Milo, any surprises there? I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled that, that people are reusing stuff, right? No need to reinvent mm -hmm. the wheel every time. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got one more audience question and then we're going to, after we get through your story, Milo, we've got some other tactical questions to get some advice for, for the audience here. But the next audience question we have here is um, how many people are working with factories overseas versus having your own factory, right? So option A, it's like, Hey, I'm using a factory overseas. I'm using a contract manufacturer or B we're using our own factory. Those are the options. And the reason I'm asking the audience this question is, Milo, the question I have for you is, um, what was it uh, like making the transition to Fitbit? Okay, with Tesla, you had your own factory floor, but uh, with Fitbit, you weren't manufacturing on your own factory floor at, at that point. So tell us about that story, that transition. Yeah. Um, first of all, I had no idea that there was going to be a difference in working with a contract manufacturer than working with your own factory. I thought it was, you know, what does it matter? You're working on a in a factory that somebody else runs versus a factory that you run. How could it possibly be different? And um, it was very, very different. Um, I think the incentives aren't totally aligned between a contract manufacturer um, and a factory that you run yourself, meaning, the CM industry has just run on razor thin margins um, and they've 
you know, been crushed there by, you know, one customer after another. And so they really, you know, they want to win the business, but then they need to make money on the business. And so a lot of times when you roll in late changes, um, they'll charge you fees for that work because they'll say it, it takes longer or I need more people to do that process. Or now you want to buy some automated equipment that's customized. We'll do that work for you. But so a lot of times when you think, when you think you're making uh, changes that would improve your product, you're actually driving up um, your manufacturing assembly costs. Um, and so that is that was just a very like new and different uh, environment to be in. I, so we just got the results back in from the audience questions. So it looks like, um, let's see. Okay. So a, a, a big difference here. So 80% are using contract manufacturers or overseas manufacturers. 20% have their own factory. So based on that, I think this next question that I have will be even, even more relevant in that case. Cause you talked about, you know, incentives don't necessarily line between the company and the contract manufacturer. So what characteristics need to align with someone's business when they're evaluating a contract manufacturing partner? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think first is right sizing the CM that you select. So if you're a small early stage company, you should really think twice if you're thinking about selecting a large multinational CM, right? Because the, the, the CMs are really you know, they have those thin margins and they're going to work hardest for the customers that are giving them the largest, you know, cash. It's just a reality. So I think getting yourself aligned with a CM that's really excited for the business that you're bringing today and in the next year before you start thinking five years in advance. Right? You're going to have to diversify your supply chain and go to multiple CMs. So your first CM should be right sized for the business that you that you have today. Excellent advice. You know, I'm, I'm interested in getting some other other feedback for the folks that are listening. So one one question I have following that is you've worked with smaller companies as well. Fitbit, Tesla, these are these are fairly large companies. What have you learned from these smaller companies that are making first generation products? Because I've got to imagine the part of the audiences within smaller organizations that are doing this that might not have the same resources a Tesla or a Fitbit has. Yeah. Yeah. I think um uh, so, I mean, step one is right size the CM you're going to select. But I think the other piece that is kind of like uh, learning for them is twofold. The, the CM can really bring a lot of knowledge in areas that they um, may not expect them to bring. So an example would be like plastic injection molding, right? A lot of CMs do have their own plastic injection molding facility, and then they have a lot of different kinds of plastic injection molding that they can do different colors, different styles, different textures, right? And I think being open to listening to your CM um, for those kind of new and innovative um, type A surfaces that maybe you weren't thinking you were going to use them for. Um, yeah, I think that, it, so, I mean, I think it's a two-way street being open to their recommendations as well. I think, I think on the downside, some things that, you know, people don't realize is, um, I see a lot of companies just assume that that these CMs are running MRP and that they're paying attention to minimum order quantities and that they're placing those orders on time. And I would just say, like, you have to be on top of that, right? Like someone needs to be making sure that those orders are getting placed on time and not just assuming that, oh, I, you know, I told them verbally to to buy this material. They must have bought it. I think mm. that's so what people fall into. No, it's a great piece of advice. Don't make assumptions. And also, hey, listen to what the CM has to say. I always look at look at it as, hey, if this person's doing contract manufacturing day in and day out, chances are they've seen some things that they're aware of that maybe myself as a single product manufacturer might not be aware of. Yeah. So, um, so, hey, we've got some questions coming in from the audience. We're going to start mixing those in towards the uh, towards the end. I have a few more questions for you, Milo, before those those come in. You know, and and maybe this will get the audience thinking of some other questions as well. How how do you turn determine the spec for how good a feature needs to be if you're doing something for the first time? As someone that's done this time and time and again, right? How do you say, you know what, this is 
good enough. This is excellent. Whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, there's two sides to that, right? There's like the minimum viable product, like does my, is my product meet my customer needs? But then there's also just like the component by component, the gold standard, right? Like uh, type A surfaces, what's allowed and what's not allowed. And, um, and, it, and it differs between engineers, right? You'll have engineers in your company that uh, may expect a lot. And then you'll have engineers who may expect too little. And you're thinking, we can't send it out with that like scratch on it. Um, so I think um, that it's a huge challenge. And I think getting everybody aligned to going through the gold you know, standard units and making sure that everyone agrees like, okay, this is acceptable. This is not right. And making sure you have a real quality lab at the CM with the lighting that you're expecting. I mean, that stuff's just super important. Love the very specific advice around these areas. Um, yeah, no, ab <laughs> absolutely. You know, one, I guess I have one final question to put a bow around this part of the discussion. Then we've got some audience questions. Uh, I've got a few more coming in after that as well. But, you know, looking back on your career so far, Milo, I have to ask you, what's attracted you to sustainability and wellness? Like from the get-go within your career, if I look at a common thread between things you've done, whether it's sustainability at Tesla, Fitbit, big wellness company, like, and then your other projects as well. Why has that been such a big part of your focus, even up till today? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm a real mission oriented person. Like I have to feel like I love the product that I'm working on. And um, there's a fabulous book called Good to Great. And um, basically it just talks about how companies that have a mission that employees can really identify with and get behind um, really like drives the best performance because people feel like they're working for a greater good. And, and I'm the same way, right? I want to, I want to work on the, the best for uh, our community, our society. I want to solve those, those problems. And, and Tesla and Fitbit really spoke to me. Excellent. Well, Hey, that takes us through the main portion of this interview, but it's uh it's time for Q and a, so keep the questions coming in. We've got a, a few queued up already. So let me jump to one of the first audience questions that came in. And this was a, this is a specific one. So for the things that are new, like the gullwing doors. So this is, this is a Tesla question. Did you ever discuss keeping or scrapping that new technology? Oh yeah, there was, I mean, there was a whole internal debate and, and we started with one technology and then we decided that technology sucked. And then just before launch, we switched to a different technology, which is better, but I don't think it's without issues. Um, I, I think it's a great, I mean, everybody loves the going doors. They're awesome. Um, uh, but it was really challenging and getting the tech right in such a short time frame was was super hard and, and we made a last minute change. Yeah, it was a little hair raising. <laughs> I just want you to know there are more questions flowing in right now. So I've this this is these are some fun car questions, right? So here's another one. How does your manufacturing background impact your decision to buy a car? <laughs> well first of all I only buy Teslas. So let's be clear <laughs> on that front. Um yeah I feel like I'll never go back to an uh, internal combustion engine car. Um, I just feel like, to, I mean, if you haven't driven an electric car, the acceleration is just unbelievable. You think like you, you like we, my husband has a BMW and I have a Tesla and driving the BMW, what is their tagline? Like the best driving machine. It's like a dog compared to the Tesla off the line. So, I mean, yeah, you'll never go back. If you like the acceleration, you don't even have to buy like a high-end model and it has like 2x the acceleration of any IC engine you're going to buy. I love it. I should be clear that this pod... Oh, oh I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I said you'll always win that stoplight race. Ah, good, good point. And I just want to be clear, this this uh, this event is not sponsored by Tesla as far as I know, but that was quite the good plug right there. So um, gosh, we got, okay. We, a, a lot of questions we're going to get to as many as we can. I think we'll get to all of them. So you, by the way, you mentioned the book, good to great there. Are there other like maybe resources you'd recommend books to someone that's getting into new product introduction, right? I know oh. that one's more of a general business book, but other resources that you'd recommend to someone that's getting into this area. 
Yeah. I mean, one of the key things in running a great new product introduction team is having great team cohesion, right? Because essentially you're running a team, uh, many of the project managers are running a team without authority, right? Like they've got, you know, they've got a rep for the manufacturing engineering team. They've got a rep from quality. They've got two people from engineering. They got someone from the CM, right? It's a big cross-functional team. Nobody actually reports to them and they have to get everybody moving the same direction and on the same page. It can be, you know, really challenging and ripe for like dysfunctional teams. Um, and so one of the books that I often uh, read with my teams is called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's the, I wish they would change the title to like The Five Functions of a Team. <laughs> but they, somehow it's some negative title. But anyways, um, really, it's a fable about a Silicon Valley management team. And it just talks about the core values that you need to have like a, in a high performing team. And when you read it as a team, right? everybody will identify something in that, in one of those team members in that book that they've actually been doing. And then it runs through like, it, during the, the fable, it talks about why those different attributes are not beneficial to helping the team be successful as a whole. So it's a great way um, to kind of bring up those conversations of like, what good teamwork looks like and how to be a high performing, you know, awesome team. You're the second person, I think, that's appeared on Manufacturing Happy Hour that's mentioned the five dysfunctions of a team. So usually when the second person mentions it, it's when I need to pick up a copy uh, for my own as well. So excellent practical advice. More questions coming. And I'm actually going to scroll up because we have uh, have a few here. So there was another interesting one here. Um, this goes back to both Tesla and Fitbit. How would you rate the maturity level of Tesla or Fitbit's approach to product data infrastructure? Yeah. Um, I took a lot of the lessons that I learned at Tesla um, to Fitbit. I think I, I owned all the data systems on the factory floor and the generation of all that data. Um, that data is like a wealth of knowledge. You're gonna know everything that's happening in your products with that data. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great like pre-read to how your product is gonna perform in the field. Um, and so when, we, when I transitioned to Fitbit, Fitbit was having the CMs own that data and it was really hard to get that data out and see how are, how are these, you know, what is our first pass yield? What, why, what is the Pareto of the first pass yield? What's going wrong there? Um, and so we transitioned um, all the Fitbit data onto Fitbit owned servers so that we had real time access to how, you know, all the data collection was happening. And, and it, it was really instrumental to improving uh, Fitbit's, you know, first pass yield and, and performance. Kind of on the same vein of, of that question, another one that's come in is, uh, what role does data play in first generation products? How do you know what to test and what the spec should be? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, I mean, you're going to set those up usually in the C build, right? So you've got your A build, which is like your first engineering cobbled together thing. You've got your B build. Um, I would say that's different for vehicles than it is for consumers. So you've got your, your B build, which is form, fit and function, but maybe not all your parts are off tool. You've got your C build where everything's off tool, right? Maybe you're qualifying um, multiple iterations of tooling. And it, it's during that C build that you're going to start to get all that data that's being built on the manufacturing line. You're going to start to see all that data and you're going to start to look at um, process control and capability and start to really define, you know, what is acceptable, right? And there are going to be certain standard deviations outside the norm where you're going to trigger different alarms, right? Alarm one might be like, call, call an engineer, you don't have to stop the line. You know, phase two may be like, oh, you know, slow down production. Phase three may be like, just stop like, and wait for the, wait for somebody to wake up because you have to, like, you're not making good product. So that's all maybe like in your run before you get to serial production, that's going to happen. 
I love the really good how to advice that you've pulled from from all your experience, right? All the tips and and step by step things people can do when they're in this space. We have another question about your story, though, and it's something that my fault is as, as a host kind of glossed over, right? We kind of jumped right into Fitbit. But what brought you to Fitbit? What uh, what attracts you to that as as a, a move in your career? Oh, well, I wish it was like a deep philosophical answer. <laughs> I was feeling a little burnt out at Tesla after eight and a half years. Mm. My kids are begging me to drive them to school just one day a week, mom. And so, you know, I had a soft spot in my heart and I said, okay, I'll take a job in the city that's two miles away from our home. I'll be able to, you know, drive everybody to school and make you lunch and do everything. And of course, I didn't really realize what new product introduction overseas meant. And then I spent about 30 to 40 percent of my time on the road in China, um, which I think didn't totally satisfy them. They loved having me home, but um, it was a lot of international travel. Understood. Well, it is always refreshing hearing someone making moves for their personal life, not just for their career as well. And um, yes, I think we've all been in the same boat before where sometimes though what we thought it would be kind of changes a little bit and there, there end up being other aspects there. But you know, another question came in here, it kind of related to, you know, big projects and and, and staying focused and, and um, you know, not burning out. So reward for long project times, people at full burn is, is the way it was phrased. How are you handling this with your teams? How do you manage, let's say, the people aspect as, as you're going through it? Yeah, I think it's um, it's a great question. I, you know, being a new product introduction is like being a full time firefighter, right? Like ev something is always happening. Somebody's always run out of parts or, you know, something doesn't work at all times. And um, for the people that that worked for me, I really tried to offer them the opportunity for to not be in that role all the time because it is it's all consuming 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, um, you know, we did that by transitioning them into production manager roles on the floor, which are actually like a very nice, um, like controlled environment, right? So they are the NPI manager going into the product launch, and then they transition into the production manager. Um, and it gives them that opportunity to really get some experience, managerial experience, um, running a line, but it also puts some nice guardrails on the hours that you're going to put in, right? Because shift time is very reliable and certain, right? And so then they would go out, they'd run a line for, you know, six to 12 months, and then they would come back into the MPI organization um, and run another project. Another question about, uh, I guess, the people side of things, the culture side of things at companies, you know, how do you determine if you're going in to NPI, how do you determine if you're going to be a fit for NPI at a particular company, right? I think this is also just a general, how do you determine if you're going to be a fit for that company culture, but maybe specific to NPI? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I know the answer to that question. I would say... Uh, I'm not sure I have an answer, just to be honest. I mean, cultural fit is for a whole company. I don't think it's specific to MPI. I think, you know, the culture of a company is the same in NPI as it is in if you're a manager in supply chain or engineering, right? Like if they have a fabulous culture that's wonderful to work for, like you're jazzed to come to work every day, um, whether you're in NPI or one of the other groups. I think it's a very fair answer to that question, right? I mean, I, I would agree. It's, you know, beyond just the culture of one one team or one organization, right? It's everyone that's there as a whole. A um, couple more specific questions. We're in the 10-minute the home stretch, less than 10-minute home stretch. So if you have any final questions, pop those in the chat. Um, but the, one of the ones that's popping up here is, uh, how does the design and manufacturing approach differ between an automotive brand like Tesla versus consumer electronic brands like Fitbit. Yeah. One of the things that I didn't realize um, when transitioning from automotive uh, to consumer electronics is that the field reliability expectations are dramatically different. So at Tesla, cars have to last a decade or longer. 
Um, and so you're really focused on long-term quality um, for your product. Whereas, you know, a Fitbit, 12 to 18 months, you want someone to buy another Fitbit. They're not that expensive. You want them to have the latest generation. So they actually don't last forever. Some of them do, but not all of them. And, um, and that's okay. And there's also no iteration on the existing product at many consumer companies, right? It's, it's develop it, launch it, and then let it run for like nine to 12 months. And in, and in the background, you're spinning up your next product. Whereas for Tesla, you know, where we were doing constant iteration, we probably changed a hundred parts a month on a car, just, you know, refining the engineering design and making sure that we were ensuring the car was going to last a decade. Makes sense. Milo, I think we're entering a rapid fire phase of the conversation because when I mentioned that, a lot of questions came in. So I think we've got time for about three or four more at this point. So I'm going to try to try to pick the ones that are at the top of the list. So here's a good one. What's one core piece of advice you would give to an NPI leader who is leading their first first generation product? Oh, gosh, that's the hardest one. And you're in the <laughs> hardest place. Uh, you were in my shoes. I mean, life is a journey of learning. And when you stop learning, it sucks. So stay on the learning path. And, um, and it's okay to be open with everybody that you're learning and discovering this process on your own. I think, um, you know, new product introduction is really about collaboration across teams. And just getting the channels of communication open is like the number one thing that you can do to support these cross-functional teams and launching new products. Another one that came up was, um, would love to know what part of the development process you feel is most risky. Does NPI risk feel different at a company like Tesla than at a company like Fitbit? Oh man, the placing of the orders for the production tooling is like the biggest nail brighter, right? Because essentially you're just, you know, you're, spending all the company money for usually and um and you don't have a whole lot of certainty that this product is exactly what you want right you're kind of you're, you're boxing yourself into this is the product we're going with but you may not have gotten all your reliability results back so i would say that that kind of moment of placing the production tooling is just a real nail biter right it's the, the you're going out on that diving board and you're not coming back Another question, we're going to switch gears here a little bit, no pun intended, um, but uh, what, do you, what do you see the future of car as a service being? Now we're getting out there a little bit more <laughs> from, 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 your, from your Tesla days. So yeah. especially when Tesla is moving towards autopilot, I'm just adding some context that's in there. Yeah. The value of the car, so the majority may switch to that model. Do you see that model accelerating soon? A lot of good car puns in, in that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, there's a lot of people exploring cars as a service, right? Not only for the AV side, um, but also because batteries are incredibly expensive, right? And you have to pay in advance. I mean, part of the reason EVs are expensive is because you got to pay for that battery up front. And so when you turn a car into, you know, cars as a service, maybe you don't need the car as a service, but maybe the battery is as a service. All of a sudden you open up the ability for um, to have much lower cost vehicles, um, and so I, I, we see, I see a lot of startups where cars as a service is, you know, becoming a real theme. Excellent. Here's a, here's another quick one that we've got. And you're, by the way, thanks for being a trooper and answering all these that come in. Everyone's got a lot of good, very curious questions here. Um, let's see. How do you influence the level of automation in a factory you don't own? Again, 80% of our audience here does not own their factory. So how do you influence that? Yeah, yeah. Usually you go, we at Fitbit, we went in right from the beginning and said, we've designed this product for automation and we want to automate it. And the automation vendor was found by Fitbit, not by the factory, right? And so, so Fitbit was in control of that automation vendor. Um, so I think um, assuming that you could go to a CM and that they have the capability on staff to build a fully automated line is might be true, but might not be true. 
I've got one more data question for you, and then I think we've got time for one more to wrap this interview. So there have been a lot of good data questions that that people have brought up. And this one is, can you speak to the balance of extracting data from processes without overboard, overburdening the personnel? Yeah, yeah. Um, it really comes down to having a like a great backbone for data analytics. Right. And a lot of people have a team that runs that data analytics backbone, but I think it's having the software to support. So it's really easy. Right. When you log in to your company website, you know, you click on your group's page, up comes that automated data. You know, you can see first pass yield right off the bat for the past 24 hours. Right. So I think automating the visuals is really important and not expecting people to go in and extract and then do the analyzation. I think that's. I think automation is the name of the game. Love it. Milo, you've answered a ton of our questions. It was excellent getting to hear your story. We want to end on a note that allows you to choose your adventure here. So we went a lot of different directions today, covered a lot of ground. Is there anything you wish that we would have asked that we haven't yet or anything that you want to leave the audience here at Build Better with? Yeah. Um, I would just say that... Um, that running new product introduction, having that opportunity is a wonderful way to meet people across every organization and to be that glue that kind of removes those silos and brings people together as a cross-functional team. So I would say if anybody's thinking about, you know, running new product introduction for their company, it's a really fun opportunity to get to interact, you know, with many different groups and, um, and just to be, you know, bring real culture to the to the company. Being the glue to remove silos. Excellent piece of advice to wrap our conversation with. Milo, thank you so much. And thank you, Instrumental, for having us as we uh, kick off this discussion. And uh, at this point, I think it's safe to wrap. Thank you so much, everyone.